A mysterious woman with a checkered past is drawn towards a monastery in the Welsh countryside. In the monastery, she encounters horrors so foul that the mere sight of them would have driven lesser mortals mad. But she also encounters allies, and together they find the source of the horrors and expel it from the monastery, and by extension, from the mortal realm. This marks the beginning of a tale spanning generations, a globetrotting adventure that will take us from the world's countryside to the Chinese province of Manchuria in search of an immortal monk. We will hunt demons in the cities of Europe under the heavy clouds of World War I, and finally, we will journey to America to stop a demon invasion from another dimension. This is a retrospective on a franchise that lived and died on the PS2. A franchise that is today completely forgotten by the masses. This is a retrospective on Shadow Hearts. You don't know what Shadow Heart is, really? Okay, neither did I until I just happened to come across the first game in the series, Kudelka, as I was working on a PS1 Hidden Gems video. Kudelka gripped me with its dark atmosphere, brutally honest narrative and compelling characters. And it gripped me so hard that I decided to play the three other games in the series to see how they held up against the first one. Do they? Well, you'll have to wait for part two, because the first part of this is all about the game that started it all. So, let me take you on a journey to the world's countryside and into the wonderful world of Kadelka. Our first stop in the Shadow Hearts retrospective. The game opens as our titular heroine is drawn towards a mysterious monastery. While trying to find a way into the monastery, Kodelka hears the sound of a struggle, and she breaks through a window to find a man badly injured and under attack from a nightmare creature. Kodelka fends off the nightmare creature, and she forms an uneasy alliance with the man that she just saved, and together they set out on a quest to find the source of the monsters, and more importantly, find a way out of the monastery. If you're comfortable with early Resident Evil's level design, you're gonna be right at home in this game. The monastery is the entire game. As we go through, we're gonna pick up things that unlock other things, allowing us to access more and more of the monastery. And at certain points in the game, there are bolted doors that we can unbolt from the inside, allowing us to easily backtrack or front track to certain sections of the monastery. As our heroes enter the monastery's servant quarters, they encounter the groundskeepers, who inform them that the monastery was converted into a mansion some time ago, and that it was the home to a prominent family up until recently. The groundskeepers offer our two protagonists food, and while Edward accepts, Kodelka does not, as she suspects the food is poisoned, a suspicion that later proved true when Edward becomes violently ill, to the point that Kodelka must use her magic powers to cure him. In their search to confront the groundskeepers, our two survivors come across a Catholic priest, James, and they save him from a monster. While James doesn't believe the story about the groundskeepers trying to kill our heroes, he does team up with our protagonist to find out what happened to the mansion. Up until now, I've held off on explaining the game's combat system because you can't really get a feel for it until you have the entire party assembled. But since James has now joined, the combat comes into itself. If Parasite Eve is Final Fantasy VII trying to be Resident Evil, then Kodelka is Final Fantasy VII trying to be Silent Hill and it's a combination that works surprisingly well. It has the RPG elements of Final Fantasy. Your characters have stats and they level up, and through these level ups you can build them however you want by spending points in their various attributes. The higher the skill is in an attribute, the stronger the affected ability will be. Like, my Kodilka has a lot of points in intelligence and mind, so her spells are strong. Combat happens when our party is traversing the mansion. At random points the party will be attacked, and the game will transition into a battle screen. On the battle screen, the game becomes a turn-based RPG, and you can move your party around on the board and perform various actions. Each monster has an element and various strengths and weaknesses, and it's up to you to find and exploit these weaknesses to take them down. The Silent Hill thing comes into play through the game's monster design. The monsters are terrifying, and while other RPGs often suffer from having basically the same roster of enemies as their competitors, Kodelka does not. 
You got your three-headed upside-down gunman, this weird crystal thing, this stone man, these haunted chairs, this rat that looks like a skinny woman in a rat suit more than it does a big rat, and scariest of them all, the demon baby. Demon babies are scary enough on their own, but can you make it even scarier? Yes, yes you can. You give it the lower body of a spider, of course, and how do you make a demon baby that has the lower body of a spider even scarier? You change the spider legs to more baby legs, and then you have this thing, and it will definitely haunt your dreams. But the Silent Hill inspiration isn't just limited to the monster design, but also how the monsters are framed and how you fight them. You're never going up against hordes as an example, and you never really feel like you can easily win a fight. Every fight is very intimate and personal, and it feels like one wrong step can be the end of your party. And in later points in the game, that is not far off. And then there's the whole fighting thing. Like other survival horror games, items are scarce and very valuable. And when you have to worry about ammo and medkits when you're fighting enemies that can actually put up quite a good fight, then that just raises the tension level. Deeper inside the mansion, a human intruder attempts to kill our protagonists, but they fight him off and question him. The thief, Elias, claim that the groundskeepers tried to kill him, and that they have killed others who have trespassed on the grounds. After Edward executes Elias, the party discovers the room where Elias had hidden his loot. Here, Kudelka receives a vision and learns that prior to the mansion being a monastery, it was a prison, and something has awoken the spirits. Their search for the source of the spirits' unrest lead them to the tomb of an ancient monk. However, the monk, Roger Bacon, is far from dead. And he reveals that he escaped death by performing a ritual from the emigre document. A document that the current owner of the mansion, Patrick, is now in possession of. A document that he wishes to use for something. Upon this discovery, James comes clean and reveals that his purpose for coming to the mansion was to recover the document on behalf of the Vatican, because Patrick stole the document from their library. As our heroes enter the cathedral to confront Patrick, a gargoyle attacks the party and Godelka becomes separated from Edward and James. As she tries to find her way back to her party members, she is kidnapped by Octon, one of the groundskeepers. As Octon is about to kill Godelka, his wife Bessie shoots him. She then tells Godelka that the lady of the house, Elaine, was killed by a thief who broke into the mansion. And since then, the couple have lured and killed countless trespassers to avenge Elaine. And Bessie fears that this is what has upset the spirits. As she concludes her story, she turns the gun on herself and pulls the trigger. As much as Kudelka is a game about uncovering the mysteries of a secluded mansion, it is also very much a game about three very broken people that are forced to rely and trust each other if they want to see their next sunrise. And it's during scenes like these where the protagonists are completely helpless that I'm reminded of Silent Hill again, in a good way. The story of this game is rough, there is some real mature subject matter here, and through the game's cinematic we can see that the ordeals that our characters are enduring is beginning to take a toll on them. At this point in the game, Kodelka is no longer able to keep up her no fucks given attitude. She is visibly distraught when horrible things happen at this point. And Edward is different. Ever since he murdered that thief in rage and frustration over the thief's greed, he has changed. He is no longer the fun-loving adventurer that we originally encountered in the stables. He's much more serious, and that's neat. In the way a plot about a horrible murder mansion that fucks with people's sanity can be neat. Finally there's James, he's questioning his faith and he has come to terms with the fact that there are monsters present in this mansion that defy his view of the world, and defy the holy text that he has lived his life by. And you can tell through his voice actor that the character is questioning the fundamentals that he has lived his life by up until this point. None of the characters by this point are the same people that we originally met at the beginning of the game. They have changed, they have evolved. They seem to have an actual narrative arc that has to play a feeling for the characters and hoping that nothing bad will happen to them. And that's impressive as fuck when you consider that this game was made by a small studio in 1999 on the PlayStation 1. It's such an impressive feat that the only other game I can think of that makes you give similar fucks about the protagonist is that the premonition. And that game released more than a decade after this one. But back to the story. Kudelka realizes that the spirits are not back because of the murders that the groundskeepers committed, but because Patrick is attempting to resurrect his wife with the emigre document. She makes her way back to her party, 
and together they race to stop Patrick from performing the resurrection. And this is the point in the game where my original video ended, but I want to take a minute to just say something here. Originally when I was making the PS1 Hidden Gems video, I was only gonna play two hours of each game on this list. Just enough to get a basic outline of the plot and a feel for the gameplay. But two hours into Kodelka wasn't enough. And this is the point I was in the game when I realized that it had been over two hours. I knew that I had probably overshot the two hour mark by a bit, but I was nine hours into this game. Can you remember the last time you started playing a game and didn't stop for nine hours? I know I can't. And I didn't stop after the nine hours and the much needed sustenance and pee break either. I needed to know where the story was going. And where is it going? James has not been very forthcoming. The ghost of the lady of the house that we have been seeing throughout the mansion. James has a connection to her. See, despite his American voice actor, James was a poor lad from Ireland who got a scholarship to Oxford University. Here, he met Patrick and the future lady of the house, Elaine. Both James and Patrick pursued Elaine romantically, but because of James' low standing as a working class lad from Ireland, he gave up his pursuit, and so Patrick and Elaine fell in love. Heartbroken, James left the university and became a priest, and while the thought of Elaine haunted him for years, he never thought that he would once again see her or Patrick. That was until Patrick stole the immigrant document. Listen now, what have I left with? I have no meaning in my life. Damn it! What have I been doing with my life? Elaine! Elaine! As our heroes find a secret passage through the mansion's library that gains them access to the back room of the cathedral without having to deal with the gargoyle. James' past as a chemistry student comes in handy as he fashions a bomb and blows up the back room door that Patrick had barricaded. Inside the back room, holy plant groves cover most of the room from floor to ceiling, a sign that something unnatural has taken place. Patrick must have been successful in resurrecting Elaine, but how could he if her spirit still haunts the mansion? Beneath a crypt they find Patrick's corpse, and its advanced state of decay can only be the result of one thing. He was successful in resurrecting Elaine's body, but not in returning her soul to her body. And in order to put the other angered spirits that haunt the mansion to rest, our party must find and kill the abomination that is Elaine's cursed body. And the search for her is not long. After the party ascends the church bell tower, they come across a cocoon, and as it hatches, the party's suspicion of Elaine's soul estate proves true. She is nothing but a monster. She attacks the party, and then they flee up the stairs of the bell tower. But stairs have one universal law that governs them. At some point, you run out of them. And as the party makes their way to the top of the bell tower, they have but one choice, and that is to fight. And they do. But Elaine's monstrous form proves to be too much of a challenge even for our battle-hardened party. And despite their valiant effort, she makes short work of them. And as she is about to deliver a final blow to the party, James comes to terms with the faith that the mansion had made him question. And he gets up and he faces Elaine. And he prays to God to aid him. And God does. Accepting James' sacrifice, he smites them both, putting their spirits to rest, and by extension, putting the mansion to rest. Kodelka and Edward descend the tower, and after spending a night together, they go their separate ways, never to see each other again. Or will they? Maybe we'll find out next time when we tackle Shadow Hearts, the pseudo sequel to Kodelka and the proper first entry in the Shadow Hearts trilogy. But, 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 but. We're not done yet. Here on Growing Up Gaming, we first dig up obscure titles and review them, which we just did. But after that, we asked the question, is the game worth playing? And yes, it is. 
I'm making a retrospective on the entire franchise based on my experience with the first game, for fuck's sake. So yeah, go play the thing I just played. It's a Silent Hill meets Final Fantasy VII mashup that has a mature story that makes both of those titles seem PG-friendly in comparison. This was a good game, and I'm excited to see what the people at Sacknock throw at us next time, when we tackle Shadow Hearts. Thank you.